Welcome, everyone. So we, as usual, we wait one, two minutes um, for, for the uh, get a bit more, more audience. And hopefully, because we are sharing a laptop today, it's a bit, we had some, some technical challenges this morning. So we spilled his own laptop and, you know, he's coming from Munich. So hopefully you can hear me. And yeah, so we did a test this morning and went really well. So hopefully uh, it's, it's okay. So if not, then maybe please uh, let us know. So Megan is also in the background for technical support if it doesn't work. Let's see if I'm ready. Going live. Okay. So I guess it's all good. Oh, just gonna cut the okay. Okay, so let's start. So I the next slide. Um <laughs> Maybe Phil. Sorry, guys. Today we have always at the beginning a few. Perfect. So as you have all seen in the invitation, so today we have a, a international guest guest speaker from it, Professor Philip Schmidt Koplin from uh, uh, the Helmholtz Center in Munich, Germany, and he's also a professor at the Technical University in Munich. And maybe not aware, but tech, the Technical University in Munich is one of the few. Uh, universities of excellence in Germany. So, please. yeah, I think you all, oh, more or less everyone, I guess, have seen me or know, knows me already. So, I'm Michael Netzel, a senior research fellow at the Center for Nutrition and Food Sciences, this in Quafi. And before we start, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners and the custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. On behalf of the traditional owners, I pay respect to the ancestors and the descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. So just the usual housekeeping. I mean, the regular uh, uh, audience knows, you know, this. it's always the same. So we'll have a presentation, first presentation will go until approximately uh, 12.45, then you have 15 minutes for quest uh, questions and, and answers. And please type your uh, questions in the Q&A tab and not the chat function. So that's always, uh, you know, if always this issue, please only in the Q&A. And then we discuss everything at the end uh, and then can you know, run through this presentation. Next slide, please. Yeah, I already mentioned this. So. Uh, Professor Schmidt Koplin, he's uh, a director at the Helmholtz Center in, in, in Munich. The Helmholtz Center is, I think, comparable, I'm not sure if you're aware, like the Max Planck, like, as, uh, comparable to the Max Planck Institute. It's a high uh, level research institute or organization in Germany. And he's also a professor uh, at the Technical University, University in Munich uh, and related to the analytical food chemistry. And I got two pages and Phil is really a, a, a international renowned and well uh, recognized um, uh, scientist in, in photomics and metabolomics. And I got two pages of awards and everything what he, what he received, but I want to keep it really brief for today's uh, tailored to today's um, uh, presentation. So Phil's team performs tailored and comprehensive metabolomics in the food health space. He has a strong profile in analytical chemistry with integrated approaches combining ultra high resolution mass spectrometry, separation sciences, and MR spectroscopy with bioinformatics for the description of complex organic systems on a molecular level. A focus in the last um, decades was to implement ultra high resolution mass spectrometry into applications for rapid and robust tool for deep meta, uh, meta wood piping and small molecule Lewis profile, and lots of metabolomics. You see, also for me, I'm struggling with some of the terms, and and really high level, uh, uh, yeah, foodomics. 
Uh, one focus is on the chemical understanding of microbiomes in foods, health, and environments, and integrating this information with existing biological omics data. So really, I think a very important uh, uh, field of research, you know, combining these uh, all these innovative current topics with high-level uh, analytical tools. So Phil, please, the Zoom is all yours, and yeah, go ahead. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you as well, um, Jasmina, Michael, for inviting me actually here. So I'm I'm directly sitting next to Michael on site uh, at YouTube, and uh, I'm very glad to be here and to be able to share with you actually my thoughts and some ideas and concepts we developed over the last two decades with some applications actually in this field. So as well here, I acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today and pay my respect to their ancestors and their descendants. Um, definitely, I will bring you actually in the chemistry of life and bring life in a nutshell and food is part of that, but from the perspective of an analytical chemist. And that's an artwork actually of uh, Ursus Verli, uh, who actually is having uh, this deconstruction because what we what we do uh, in, oops, uh, what, what Sorry, I'm just struggling with the, the band on the top. What we do actually is we we classify, we deconstruct, we, we classify, and then we reconstruct the issues. And that's the principles of binary chemistry. And I will bring you actually in this world today uh, with different approaches and applications. And uh, these applications will be in foodomics, where it's the metabolomics approach, metabolite profiling in foods, and give you this vision of chemical diversity of biomes and abiomes, these two, di two directions of chemical diversity, uh, which we can provide. Uh, I'm, I'm really thankful for the whole team behind on one side, together with Michael Richlick at the TUM, at the Technical University. Uh, he's chairing actually the, the, the chair of analytical food chemistry. I'm associated there as a professor, and I'm heading actually the analytical bio 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 chemistry. Uh, research Unit Institute at the Henry Center of Munich, and that's my team as well, as you see with a lot of children behind it. it was our last summer party, the first one after three years after the corona time. So now people come together again and can communicate. That's why also I'm very glad to be here. So at the tomb, actually, uh, we are heading the comprehensive food on platforms. So we have projects where we profile metabolites in food. Uh, we go into the nutrition and a little bit in the microbiome issues as well in these projects at the tomb and at the Helmholtz are more related to nutrition microbiome health aspects because the center in Munich is actually a medical research center since December 2020, 100%. And our applications are actually in the, in the world of diabetes, obesity, where nutrition actually and microbiome have their own impact. And actually with this... Uh, TUM and Helmholtz Association, I'm, I'm actually connecting the food, nutrition, health, uh, chemical continuum using different instrumentations to profile this chemistry. The institute itself is related in three big themes, which is the chemistry of microbiome on one side, where we go into an investigation of this chemistry. Another side, we go into diabiomes uh, related to glycations. I will tell you a little bit about that in a moment where we see also a source of bioactives and we have one strength which is growing right now in applications uh, looking for new bioactives with a high content screening platform, which I won't speak about today, which, but which is a very important part to look in fun uh, functional metabolomics, to look at the bioactivity of new compounds or discover in a very explorative way, new active compounds out of mixtures, out of plants, out of food. And here we focus mainly on fermented food. So in terms of chemistry in food, nutrition, health, we look at what is coming, going in, profile the chemistry in there and look what is coming out and look definitely different body fluids such as urine, plasma, stool, water, extracts, exile breath condensates. We work with cohorts, integrate metadata. So it's not only an analysis, but it's also a use of the data we generate, the data mining, which is important. And for food, we have different ways. I mean, you have all these metabolites coming from the food itself, then you have microbe-specific metabolites, which are found in these body fluids, but you also have definitely a co-metabolism with the host, which is generating uh, um, pathways and 
degradation and changes in metabolism of some compounds which are needed in both vaccines of this microbiome host system, which is a holopiont, actually. And uh, we need some information and bioactivity testing as well for new compounds, which we, we, we define out of the systems. But in the chemistry of food, you can say purely biological type of metabolites. That's the biome and abiome. In the biome, we have enzymatic activity. And from all analytical approaches we have, we definitely see only 10% of that process. Lots of anions out there. We are in discovering the whole community in metabolomics is contributing. What I consider being abiomes are from as roasting reactions, Maillard reactions, non-biologic, non-enzymatic reactions, actually. And here you have no database. But you have a chemical diversity, which is out of reach. It's really an amazing diversity and complexity. And that's where actually uh, we need some analytical tool to go. That's why actually life is in nutshell, yes, because you have these two approaches. On one side, metabolites ruled by enzymatic reactions, and then also in the environment or in food generation and thermal processes or hybridises, a, a definitely generation of molecules with high complexity. I'm involved, I'm an organic geochemist from 30 years, and actually I'm involved in uh, also in, in carbon cycling and surface cycling environment, where actually this organics coming from life is involved in very complex uh, re reactions. And if you think about uh, pre-life and uh, origin of life and, and organic profiling on asteroids and, and, and meteorites, for example, which are witnesses of the past, their the chemistry is even wilder and more complex. I won't talk on that today. But in terms of chemical diversity, if you look at PETCHEM or the Human Metabolome Database, we definitely have millions of compounds. 100 millions could be right now. And if you look at the mass range of these compounds and the multiplicity of these compounds in terms of nominal masses, that's actually what we would have. The, uh, uh, the Human Metabolome Database with 100, probably 120 now, thousand compounds, which are in there would re be reduced in 9,000 formula forms. Yeah. But counting possibilities, we have 200,000 possible lipids, 80,000 terpenes in terms of the chemistry and the possibilities and combinatorial. How to analyze it? I mean, that's definitely the challenge. If you analyze the numeric composition, you still have a lot of isomeric structures behind that. And with Molgen, you can compute and calculate that. And it's just amazing numbers you are getting out in, as a function of the mass range for very simple element compositions. So that shows you the potential of the chemical diversity we can have. Life is quite easy and ruled by enzymatic reactions. Yeah, So you will have a quite reduced amount of compounds in the systems. But nevertheless, measuring the potential uh, existence of hundreds of compounds is is very challenging. So here we combine separation sciences, spectrometry, spectroscopy, and only in separation sciences, you see that you can separate up to, yes, one million and more theoretically compounds by combining different dimensions, yeah? Um, that's just an increasing amount of compounds in the, the range of machine here. Uh, at line and off line, it's like actually the resolution you have here is like looking at picture, yes, yeah, so with the different pixelized. Uh, the question is, how far do you need? How much the project needs to go uh, in, in describing the chemistry? Uh, you can go in target, non target, it will see in a moment as well. Mass spec as well, increasing resolution, increasing number of compounds you can measure as a function of the technology. So you see already here in spectroscopy, similarly using MR, for example, or the spectroscopy. Uh, tools, also combinations of these. And you see already here that the combinations and the existence and the reaching of this level of diversity you can describe is defined by actually the technology, which is evoluting over time. And in 10 years, we probably will have possibilities to see much, much more compounds in a much, much more high dy dynamic range. Definitely. That's the evolution we see from the technology. And we're using this technology and handling these actually and data. And that's actually, we invent, make an inventory of these 
compounds, we count the order, we combine put hypothesis, but having information on molecular level of thousands of 10,000 compounds, we need to reconstruct that residual origin and to understand where and how these molecules are connected in pathways or reactions. That's the most difficult thing in any case. So for these biomes and abiomes, uh, yes, as I told, 10% in databases, lots of unknowns out there. If you start to process your food, your biology, to roast it, to change it, you will have other reactions on the food, which will even go uh, in a higher diversity. So different ways to go. You go either in a reductionist waste way, either in a holistic way, so in a targeted or non-targeted chemical analysis approach. And all this is covered by so what we call metabolome. Metabolome is the actually it's the quantitative analysis in description of all the molecular, low molecular weight metabolites in the system. Yeah. But this quantitative analysis of all mole molecules is only possible with a few technologies such as with other methods, you will have bias in ionization and so on and so forth. So the definition is a little bit tricky, but nevertheless, we try to see as much as possible as the technology is giving us the possibility, and we can go in a targeted and non targeted And then it starts because we have a lot of data we need to mine, and that's actually most of the time is, is used in that. Our technology is in Munich, and at the two actually are divided in three platforms. One is the ultra high resolution mass spec, it's a 12 Tesla ICR TMS. It's a classical LCMS platform with uh, Brooker, Agilent, and Sykes uh, machines, and it's NMR, uh, actually, uh, Cryo, um, High Field uh, NMR, where actually we go in refining different platforms with protein. We can go in a compositional space. We will profile targets and go in pathways with a C, and we'll be able to go in structures and have quantitative aspects with them. Just to come on NMR a little bit here, that's uh, actually uh, coordinated by, Zil by Zilke, Heinzmann and the group. And uh, we are interested in how metabolites evolve along the gut as a function of nutrition. We go nutritional markers uh, with uh, human in human cohorts, but also of nice collaboration with industry, where we work on optimized dog nutrition, very nice collaboration, very keen about their animals, definitely. Will. And we combine this technology usually to FTICR or to PLC MS analysis, classical metabolomics approach with LCMS. All pipeline has been established for this high field, high resolution approach, uh, where different Yes, sample body fluids, urine, fecal material, organic tissue extracts are set up. We have a sample preparation pipeline. We have the acquisition, which has been optimized, definitely with a lot of quality controls, which are needed in this way to go in a cohort analysis. And then we go in the statistical evaluation, classically, like it's done in metabolomics, with different tools of multivariate statistics. IE is coming a little bit in, in this field as well, and more and more to go in a metabolite identification. And uh, actually it's the phenome we are looking at. Uh, and uh, it's, it's all pipeline and classy is one of the approaches we have here. Where we go in a coloration actually issue, uh, such like here, it's uh, dumped out of the cohort, where at the end we can correlate the signatures of the metabolites we see in their connectivity, structural connectivity and pathway connectivity, extract mm -hmm. pathway information so far, and also go, that's an, a mapping on the right side, of clustering of thousand urine samples, uh, when we have some very specific metabolites, which indicates you very specific medications on one side, but also endogen compounds, which enables us to differentiate pre-diabetics from the diabetic patients. And uh, these uh, samples were actually acquired analyze to look at uh, vascular disease. So we go in metabolomics and we find some uh, nice biomarkers, by early biomarkers based on this analysis. We published a lot on this field also, and definitely in the, in the, in the, in the establishment of this pipeline uh, for, for more workflows we established, yeah, uh, very keen in 
problems that may occur in, in processing uh, to enable an automatization as well, partially of these tools. Yeah. So actually, we combine in LCMS, that's the other part, yeah, uh, different uh, aspects of sample population. Similarly, a pipeline is established. That's now definitely general uh, metabolomics now in the community. We are involved in this field since 20 years. And uh, we're also doing targeted uh, metabolite analysis for child children, fatty acids, amino acids, different bile acids, new bile acids, steroids, and so on and so far. And the two specifically nicotixins and vitamins and their metabolites or precursors. And uh, the, the, these targeted and quantitative analysis is then established uh, as a function of the need of the project or is developed to, feel, to fulfill these needs. Yeah. Um, Alicia Valka is actually working in this field, and uh, we have been in, in developing models as well um, in, in different uh, ways to, to, to be able to prognose, to have a prognosis of structures as a function of retention time. And MSMS, Tandem MS, is always involved actually in our, in our history. I will show a few examples. Complementary to this uh, LCMS platforms, we have dual joint resolution take more time as examples. That's a direct flow injection, uh, where actually uh, we don't make any separation in front. We made a good sample pre preparation and desorting. And then we have a direct access actually on the compositions we can assess in databases. I will show you more about how that works, complemented with it. So let's come a little bit to this non-targeted platform and analysis with direct injection ICR, uh, FTIs, FTIs. So that's the system. It was installed 2005, actually upgraded 2010, the Rolex system. And as you can see, there is a, it's a direct injector with the cooled system. It can be run automatically. So we are running about two to 300 samples a week. Very easily can be uh, going, up, going even a higher throughput if needed, but that's, it's a good compromise in having really good sensitivity for the samples and information. Which dynamic approach. What we do is we weight the molecules in mass spec, and especially here with the precision of the mass of an electron, which is half a millimass. And we differentiate as well two compounds which have this half millimass in mass difference. And that makes the specificity of this approach. It means for such an exact mass after calibration, we have a direct assignment of an elemental composition involving all the isotopes possible isotopologues in terms of natural abundance of the isotopes. And that's just shown here with the sulfolipid as measured with the resolution uh, we, uh, we have access to and uh, the resolution of 100,000 on the top. And you see that, it, that this high resolution, you, manage, you have fine resolution, this differentiation of all isotopes. So what we do is a reverse engineering. We start from an exact mass and we re we find these element compositions. And having these element compositions, we have 10,000 of compositions out of these samples. We reduce to essential uh, in compounds and, and compositions to work. Just, just an example. This is a geosample and a biosample. That's the water extract, microorganic river, which shows these distributions of signals. This other is from SDR spectrum mass again mass 150 to 1500 of actually a whiskey. Uh, this is also to wood extraction. It's an ethanol water extraction of the wood out of the barrels in addition to everything that came into the distillate. And if you look in detail in this mass spec, every mass is covered many times. And due to the exact masses, we can go on and correlate and put actually an element composition to each signature wind means we cover here 10 thousands of, of elemental compositions. This is an aerosol, for example, the sulfur compounds we can use in the system. So what we do is we go in a network approach. And the network approach, we take this experimental data and we try to find the mass differences exactly corresponding to elements in difference. And doing so, having a network of elemental compositions of these experimental masses, having one element composition, we can retrieve all and doing so, we can go network approaches as well. Functional networks, for example, connecting 
these these experimental masses with uh, in homologous series in CH2, for example, carboxy, carboxy nations, or sulfonations, hydroxylations, or any case. And based on element compositions, we have already an idea on information. We can calculate different indexes on it to have an idea on aromaticity, on aliphaticity. An aromaticity equivalent, for example, is a good example where we can, for that some diesel extracts, no, that's some Athabasca oil samples. Yeah. We can, where out of this very complex, heavy oil type of uh, material, we can differentiate actually these different structures uh, and abundances of compounds having an increased number of aromatic in their compositions. So we have it from the composition already to describe our samples quite well uh, in terms of structural composition. That's the first approach. Another approach is to take this data and to project it in fact prevalent. You will see some in the food, and it's due to the fact that every element composition has a number of hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, and we generate this di diagrams, which is an HCOC diagram. So sugar C6H12O6 would be with an HC of two and an OC of one, so on the upper right side. That's actually just run river. That's the whiskey. Yeah. So whiskey, how is the whiskey looking at? Whiskey will have a lot of phenolic compounds with an HC of one and OC of 0.9. That's the central bubble system. On the upper right uh, here, we would have carbohydrates. We have uh, Glucosylated phenols a lot there would have heavy alcohol still remaining in the system. And the whiskey is mainly CHO type of components, mainly a wood extract we have. We can look in database and make annotations from databases. Again, project these databases, this kind of representation, to be able to annotate actually and see the regions actually go with. And then we can use 10, 100, thousand samples with the technologies and we need the technology the, 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 the data management actually that's what we established to go in an automatic calibration and in the filtering of the data the annotation as i just showed you that also from database in alignment to make a statistic and a camera metrics of that and visualize the data and usually this approach in the profiling of the metabolomes with the fti star is always integrated with an lcms or to confirm chemical structure on the second first lab. And also, that's important. With this technology, we are now comparing data we acquired eight years ago with data we are acquiring today because an exact mass and an abundance in the community of, uh, of in the chemical profile will be the same. So we are now able with such a technology to integrate on a long-term information. And that's an important point because you wouldn't be able to do this with an LCMS, for example, either you quantify. Yeah. So here as well, with some papers related to that, feel free to contact me at the end and uh, I can send you and get in contact. So as an example for, for whiskey, for example, we have distillates, we have wood extracts with this representation in fact prevalent, and we have the whiskey by itself. You see the whiskey is very close to the wood extract. Uh, we can go in counting of the compositions and we can annotate in the bases actually the possible uh, metabolites. Uh, comparing bourbon barrels and clary barrels, for example, the whiskey making, we can distinguish metabolites. And this is complemented with an LCMS, which are specific from the cherry barrels or specific for the bourbon barrels. Yeah? Knowing that here you have highly oxidized phenols out whether the bourbon barrels these are rather minor actually in abundance relative to the cherry barrels. We can go in a comparison to rum, which is also an extraction of the, the, the casts, yeah, and we end from the alcohol very close to whiskey in terms of compositional space. Uh, but the difference is mainly due to the glucosination of the phenols, which is much more abundant in the rum. You have here a distillate coming from sugar cane. You still have remaining sugars, which are involving making the, 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 the aging actually of the rum differently and bringing the other flavors in addition. To that. Using this technology, we go so far that we can distinguish actually in a, in a data set 
out of thousands of metabolites, the geography where those whiskies are coming, uh, stringing out the different metabolites of interest. And in LCMS, you could go down and get the structures of the phenols involved in this geography differentiation. Aging is an issue as well. What are the compounds which, which are oxidizing first or conjugating first in such an evolution system in age? That's something which we do in line as well, I will show you in a moment. And definitely always having an annotation from the FTMS and then going down with an analytics which enables you to have a confirmation of the structure. Let's try to go in, in the biopsy. That's just to show you a little bit out of an example, what we do with FTICR data. That was an example. We worked with the plant people at the Helmholtz. We had some, uh, in, some poplar trees, plants that are growing here uh, in different UV stresses and soil stresses and dryness of uh, uh, stresses. And in this case, we had uh, a wild type and um, uh, a change which enabled uh, reducing of the isoprene uh, emission. And uh, we, we stressed this wild type and the, uh, the, uh, the, vector, uh, the empty vector control actually in different UV stresses and went into a classical metabolomic approach with, UV, with LCMS as well, being able to differentiate the different lines and to have an effect of the stress, the UV stress on the metabolites uh, in these plants. And again, with LCMS and with FTMS combined, we see that on the gibberlins, lipids, there's not much effect. You have a little line effect, but down here, uh, you have flavonoids, which are highly improved with the UVs yeah, and steroids. If we go with FTMS actually and make mass difference enrichment, we look at mass differences actually in these thousands of masses mass differences that are corresponding to enzymatic changes, which we know are related to pathways. Yeah? And uh, looking at these and trying to look at their abundance, we then can make network. That's a molecular network based on uh, the information of metabolite transformation as from the biological knowledge, where we can replace all this experimental data and depending on the study, we can just look at up and down regulated actually substances. And definitely with this study uh, of uh, UV stress, we have on one side a line effect, which shows us an increased number of uh, prenylation or polyprenylation uh, in the lines. And in the UV stress, actually, we see in the UV stress, we see an increase in differentiation of the of the of the of the plants, uh, having a, an increased amount of condensation with phenols. So they're making their sunscreen, and these are compounds which you are not directly having in other bases, but you can retrieve indirectly through processes of curing the system and with the data we generate at this level of precision. We use this very in detail in some papers, also related to medical issues, where we found some steroid conjugation, actually very specifically in compounds, which were not in databases, and which were essential actually to understand uh, some, some issues uh, in, in FT obesity, for example. Some papers in the data mining, please connect me and for Let's come to biomes a little bit. I had some study on honey, and I know you're working on honey as well, Diaz Quafi. That's why I took this example out. Uh, we looked at different honeys interested in geographical origin, monofloral and polyfloral, and forest honey versus floral honeys. So we had a sample preparation, which was a SPE sample protocol in eluting with methanol. We used about 100. Uh, different samples here uh, from different origins uh, we found in, collected around. And that's the fact prevalent we would have on honey, quite complex uh, and complete diagram with a lot of uh, nitrogen compounds, that's the orange bubbles here, and CHO type of compounds, that's the blue dots here. And if we go in the clustering of this data all over 
uh, the different samples, we can differentiate definitely and cluster, cluster nicely. Some issue as shown here, like chestnut, eucalyptus has its own cluster. Manuka is definitely particularly here. And based on the masses and, confirm, and the confirmation in LCMS, we can then associate actually very nicely actually the compound, which are known in literature and describe new ones actually, which are highly related to the ones in these clusters we are defining. That's, the, that's actually the way to go, is to use the information out there to verify and validate the approach and then use the deep information we have in the profiles to get the connections, the correlations, and find new compounds which are highly correlated to the knowledge, you know? uh, such as here, actually, uh, confirmation with the LCMS of the details we expected to see and we saw from the experiment data. Such as an example of honey. Other examples of work and studies we are doing is, for example, with wines. We have a very nice collaboration since 15 years, 15 years plus, uh, with the University of Dijon, Institut Julio with Regis Goujon, and uh, where we have different generations of, uh, of PhDs uh, going into uh, metabolomics of wines, um, also with FTICR and LCMS, mainly right now in, on their platform, complemented with the FTICR. And uh, that would be the chemical map of a wine, uh, having all the, the, the polyphenols, the, the, the peptides with amino acids up there in these different, you can navigate actually in these different uh, fan prevalent diagrams, uh, having this uh, information on HCOC and having this information on the databases. We deconstructed wine in terms of the fermentation, looked at these different profiles in the different uh, compartments and in the evolutions, in the aging. We're very interested in oxygenation, oxida oxygenation and oxidation of wine during aging. And uh, it's also a problem at some point if you have an oxidation of wine, um, which may occur and what the cause and what can you do against that. And uh, right now we really are working on the natural antioxidant properties of uh, the, the, the grapes and the booze from the start, which is very important to measure and to know, to know how much antioxidant needs to be done and to be added actually at the beginning to enable a good aging without oxidation of this wine and keeping also best of the flavors of that product. So we, we went to different studies. One of the study was also in looking at older wines where actually you, you have a, possibility to have wines which have oxidized, yeah, which have followed in their natural aging process, this oxygenation and this oxidation partially. And uh, we did this in different sites. And again, measured with MTICR, measured with LCMS. And based on this, very easy on a PCA already, you see the differentiation of, different wind of the different wines themselves, like Chablis, Corton Charlemagne, and Verso, which are nicely differentiated from their profiles of metabolites. But in addition, there is, an, uh, there is a nice follow-up on the second uh, uh, component of the age, where you have metabolites which are specific of very old vintages. And if you look actually in detail in what compounds are specific of aging, you may see, see a lot of compounds which are nitrogen containing, which actually Maillard reaction product. So you have a condensation of reducing sugars with amino acids, peptides, and solution, which are generating this Maillard reaction products, these glu glu glucated products, which are marker of aging as well as well. And the decreasing compounds accordingly are the carbohydrates, the amino acids, and also the phenols, which are involved actually in these reactions involving the amino acids. We have some papers on that. And just to confirm even that, uh, with an example of very old wine, which was found buried actually in, in this cloister in, Abbey, in the Abbey uh, Saint-Vivant, when there was made the restoration, it was found actually on the uh, stone. Yeah, it was buried uh, when they did this in, in the 
Norwegian century. And we dated that actually to the, 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 the late uh, 18th, beginning of the 19th century, also from the bottle's shape. We analyzed this wine, which still had the shape uh, in the fact prevalent of, of older or modern wine. So it still had the signature. And the specificity of the very old wine actually as well was this Maillard reaction process, which made us also very interested to look at these products from the chemistry specific. And that's something uh, we followed up uh, here in, in Maillard, uh, very detailed Maillard reactivity actions. Yeah. Combining barley, uh, from whiskey and fermentation from wine. I mean, we, we needed to work on beer. Being from Munich, uh, we're known for breweries as well. We needed to go on that study. And Stefan did a very nice study on that. Uh, he will be part of the exchange in September from the two weeks of coming to UQ, and he will present the study. So I will pass rapidly on these results. But what we did here actually is we profiled with FTI Sierra, went into a little composition description, we're able to differentiate with multivariate statistic, the lager from the, the craft beer, from MA beer, from wheat beer. So barley and wheat beer can be differentiated by, based on metabolomes. The colorless beer is also differentiated as the Maillard reaction again. I will add. And the idea here was to provide these beers, and to provide over 500 beers, to find some rice milk because you know the German purity law just enables barley or wheat for the wheat beer, but no corn and no rice. And that's actually what we went in detail to find after all these uh, metabolite profiles and pathway analysis, the marker which we may consider as a rice marker here, which we found, which was synthesized and which is now, can now be used actually uh, in LCMS, that's an LCMS profile with for quantification for uh, measurement. Yeah. So the story behind is that you go into profiling on a composition space, you reduce the essentials, and then with additional technologies, you can combine all that stuff, uh, all this information with LCMS uh, to find the marker accordingly. Similarly, like in the wines, we had access to very old beer which was found in a cellar in Germany. And uh, people came to us and we made a sampling and the profile like modern beer with just actually oxidized hops uh, profiling in there. But using this profile, we were able to say that it's a, it was a lager beer. It's dating from 1896. It's a lager beer. It's a bottom fermentation. Definitely it's made, it's barley. No other grain is in there, definitely barley. And uh, it has followed some roasting of the grains as well, um, following some IR reaction. It has a nice and really a nice amber color when we open it. Let's come to this abayum just at the end, because that's actually the roasting is interesting. And that's the wild chemistry happening between reducing sugars and actually amino groups. Uh, leading at the end uh, to Amandori compounds, which then are going in for wild chemistry, generating different type of uh, nitrogen containing ceramic rings, which are flavors, which are tasting, which, also, which can also be toxic. And that's this chemistry, which is very wild, but very important food chemistry, uh, which we looked in detail with uh, our techniques. Acrylamide is a good example as product generated by uh, these Maillard reaction that was actually in the news uh, many years ago. It isn't under control right now because one understands the process, how that is working. We went into uh, this uh, reactivity studies with monocompounds, compounds, so that's just glycine and ribose, starting at 100 degrees in different time. Uh, schedules, and that's the spectra of increasing diversity in chemistry we obtain by doing so. It's starting to brown, to get brown, and putting it in fact prevalent, you see here already how this diversity is changing. We can lose, we can use actually the transformations, no from IR reaction, and project this in a network approach to follow up actually 
the reaction by itself. So that's actually what we did. And based on this reaction and with the different amino acids and different sugars, we will get different compounds coming out. And that's explaining the high diversity of compounds you have in such a system. And you really can follow up actually based on the reactions, which is the same for each amino acid, which is the same for each sugar involved. It's a series of mass transformations which you can follow up as a network in this reaction to describe this Maya um, system. We use this actually, and I'm coming to the end of my talk, in different applications. And uh, we were with Leopold, another PhD. Uh, we were looking actually what is happening in an oven. If you are baking actually in an oven, we collected the aerosol generated in the oven condensed it and injected it in FCRCR to follow up the, 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 the browning actually of uh, these uh, bands here over time and as a function of temperature of time and so on and so far. And that's the, 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 the oops, that's the, di the, oops, uh, that's the diversity you are getting out. Um, you're getting out uh, with, um, uh, with, with this approach in terms of composition. Lots of Maya compounds involved here, evoluted. The next step actually in this, oops, no one is, sure, sorry for that. The next step in this approach, and I wanted to show you this uh, at the end of the talk, is that we use a new ionization technique, which is called plasmion secret. Yeah, it's a called plasma-based ionization, where actually uh, the, the gas is analyzed so far in the system. We put a pipette with a little bit of dough here, uh, not, not the bun itself, it's just five milligrams of dough. We are heating in the heating block and we're directly analyzing in this cold plasma the volatiles which are occurring in the mass spec. And that's looking like this here. That's the system of cold plasma following up into during the roasting time, the different compounds which are evolved and following up these actually uh, at different times. So we get really a, a high information, a dense information in the dynamic composition and in structures over there of compounds which are following different <coughs> kinetics, which are re re representing the reactions of curing. And putting this on FTICR enables us to follow up the element compositions like shown here and putting this, uh, making the same experiments using tandem MS and quadruple MS, we can really go even with labeling, uh, with C13 labeling of, uh, of amino acids we put in the dough, we can follow up reactions occurring actually during the baking um, uh, of, 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 of bright foods. Yes, glutation, that's actually my R and uh, in food chemistry. Uh, but in the food, in the, in the medical range, uh, these glutation processes, which is my R in food chemistry from roasting, is, is a process that is occurring. It's a non zymatic reaction, which is occurring actually in our body as well, and which is generating advanced glutation end products, AGEs. Uh, known actually uh, in the medical field. And, and we have now with uh, our approach here and using LCMS as well in different fields, uh, the possibility to follow up nicely uh, with good uh, procedures, uh, AGEs and finding new biomarkers, which are AGEs actually in different, uh, in different uh, illnesses. That's actually one of the profiling we are doing right now with partners at the center. And some PhDs work on that, like Michelle, for example, uh, where we showed some uh, yeah, sequence specific glycation actually on peptides, uh, setting up rules actually, uh, which enables us to understand actually also uh, the, in, uh, in, in situ actually endogen reactions on that. And with uh, Yang Yingfei, uh, we are setting up huge databases uh, of AGEs starting from amino acids, peptides, and sugars, and uh, looking at LCMS and having tandem MS and putting a database. It will be online soon, where we will have a, you will have access also to this uh, information. 
And uh, that's actually the, the LCMS we developed uh, to look at peptide glycation products. That was a missing link actually between metabolomics and, and peptidomics or proteomics, which we, we set up as a niche here with the tools, which can be used now actually to look at glycations. And that's actually a link uh, where we learn from food chemistry and use this knowledge actually in, in our medical chemical approaches and, and, and applications. Yes, I'm coming at the end of my talk actually, and hope I was able to, to show you a little bit on chemical diversity uh, with the, the systems chemical analytics approach we have for these complex mixtures, uh, differentiating biomes and abiomes in terms of uh, their analytics and the understanding of uh, the, or the, 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 the assessment of unknowns actually in these systems. Uh, we really deal with a lot of unknown chemistry in biology and 90% in everything what I'm looking at is just unknown. And if we have roasting effects like in food, this is even increased because chemistry is really unknown over there. And uh, really move towards uh, high and big data. And it's really the data mining which is essential and which is progressing. Technology is involving and metabolomics is technology, definitely. And uh, the development of these technologies will enable us more and more information which we need to handle and i think ie is really getting now also in the group in different projects complement or actually to multivariate statistics uh, some proof of, of, of applications um, so at this point again thanks for some money givens behind um, and thanks to you as well for the for the invitation here and the presence i have here also to see uh, here at Elkhorn, the new building and the facility and and also this painting which has in the entrance from Mulkum. Uh, we assisted her when she painted that and when she passed, so sorry. And it was a wonderful uh, meeting with her and uh, having this concept of uh, food uh, in, in, in in the painting. I mean, the painting is here. So thank you so much, and I'm open for questions. Well, Philip, thanks very much for this excellent presentation, and I hope you know everyone got a kind of a, a inside view about the complexity of you know using high-level analytic tools, but also you know the possibilities and the potential what you can achieve not only in food science and yeah, but also in in you know related to health and you know health outcomes, biomarkers. I'm um, just checking the. Two and A, and it's empty. Unbelievable. So I, not sure if you have a question now. Please type it in. I have a question to fill. Please feel free. You know, it doesn't matter. Even if you didn't understand something, you know, please just don't feel scared. Type it in, and and we will try to answer. So my question to you is. Um, I mean, it's very, very complex, and also for me, you know, it's enormous, I think, enormous potential. So when you, because there's always a question, you know, from a, let's say, economic perspective, like a, a cost-benefit analysis, say, look, you have all these tools, but what are the costs, the time, you know, you, you need, and to show how specific are the results you need, and, and, and maybe you want it. So would you, when you compare this to maybe some, other more or less not so sensitive high throughput essays. Can you we have an idea about like the costs of something? Like for example, when you when you profile a wine. Bad <laughs> question. No, 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 no. I just think because that's all the questions and yeah, great, you have all these tools and sometimes you know when you in medicine you say look we need this because we need exactly you know that uh, any biomarkers for disease or health, what you said. And but I'm, I'm just thinking if there also, you know, some, um, uh, uh, you know, ideas or, or, or in this direction to have it like, you know, but, you know, of course, when you said all of these projects with companies and, and, and industry, like, uh, you know, cost benefit analysis to say, okay, we need to use these tools and, Example, you know, the urine samples. That's also one which we are also interested. Say, so look, maybe that's you know the cost, and it's you know from a yeah. 
I mean, to, to answer on that, we have these different platforms. On one side, the classical metabolomic platform is the LCMS platform. It's now used everywhere, and it's a whole community behind. Uh, stating this as cost, the cost we would have in, uh, in, in, in classical for that would be around, I don't know, 200 euro, for example, something like that. For the NMR, it would be a little bit cheaper. For the FTICR, it's much cheaper. Uh, I mean, I'm not really thinking in costs because I'm not an analytical platform. Yeah, um, but I'm using this technology as a function of the needs I have for the for the studies I'm doing. Yeah, but what I see is every method has its advantage, and um, the FTICR approach is. Uh, the collaboration we have in industry, they are very keen in, they see that with this technology, you have a profile of thousands of elemental compositions in five minutes. That's done in five minutes. As compared to the LCMS, where you have much more information in terms of structures, but where you need at least half an hour, three to a quarter of an hour, if you want to do it in helic and reverse phase combined. So they go as we do in a first step in a profiling, short profiling by time um, for many, many samples, having a statistical evaluation already, and then um, having after this statistical evaluation, uh, the, 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 the way to go deeper with the other tool with, with LCMS on even a quantitative analysis of the metabolites, yeah. knowing where the disease are. The other thing is that with this technology and the, the partners in the industry, they understood that, we can compare now samples we analyzed eight years ago. And if in five years I have two projects, I will be able, with the right QCs and SOPs, I will be able to integrate the data in five years mm -hmm. with the data I'm generated now and I generated eight years ago. And this is really a, a breakthrough with this resolution you have with this tool as compared to mm -hmm. LCMS, where it's getting more difficult because the, the the column phases are changing, the instruments are changing, the retention times, everything is different. Mm -hmm. So you have to think a little bit different. The only thing which is constant is more or less the mass, yes, and the fragmentation. That's how the database is set up. Yeah? Yeah. But in, some, in terms of relative quantification and profiling of the compounds, mm -hmm. FTICR is one of the methods which even in industry and even the high cost at the beginning to buy it, afterwards it's it, the costs are reduced because you measure a lot of samples mm -hmm. and you have a lot of advantages. Okay, well, thanks. Thank you. There's a question in the QA uh, section. So, how you discover, uh, have you, sorry, have you discovered metabolites from microbiome that protect people from di diabetes or other chronic diseases? Well, that's a whole course or that's a whole story. I mean, what we have, we, we have access to cohorts. Yeah, and that's actually the point where accessing on cohorts and having the metadata on the cohorts enables us from a statistical way to go down to metabolites and to describe these metabolites. Um, the, the question was, the, that protects yeah. people from diabetes. Yeah. Um, I, I won't be able to discover compounds that protect people from diabetes because that would need to go into a, a human trial, yeah? where you mm -hmm. have already a compound that by a hypothesis may have an effect and you go in a trial. Uh, what, what we discovered, uh, for just to give an example in this direction, is uh, we had a study on uh, prebi probiotics and we, we screened 50 different strains of probiotics uh, on their uh, immunoregulation. And uh, we found actually a compound which was uh, very active on that, which was D-tryptophan. Uh, the D form of, of tryptophan. And this D tryptophan, actually, uh, we were able to use it as a micro, uh, microbiome regulator by giving it to mice which, were ast which had asthma with a dysbiosis of their microbiome. We were able with D tryptophan to reestablish a microbiome which is quite the same than the healthy one of the wild type we were, we were looking at. And definitely the symptoms of uh, asthma were reduced. And that's actually an issue which we even patented where we go actually in uh, supplementation and in human trials uh, with asthma, people who have asthma to look at uh, these uh, changes in microbiomes 
and the response on the symptoms. Uh, so, so it's a long way to go uh, to find a new compound that then can be used uh, in a way with all the ethical ways to go through. So that's something that we cover now for over 10 years. Yeah. But, but that's actually the way to go. To find a new compound, you need to have the adequate uh, mm -hmm. bioactivity testing platform. And the one we use right now is based on single cell phenotyping, high content screening or cell painting, uh, where we go in a non-targeted bioactivity testing and combine this actually with the deep metabolomic profiling we do with the different tools. That's actually a good way if we have a new compound, a new biomarker, to test its activity on cells and discover as well activities relative to the thousands of compounds we also put through our systems from chemical libraries of known mode of actions. But that's another story, actually. Please contact me for that. Yeah, no, thanks very much, guys. Unfortunately, we are already, I think it's after 1, 1, yeah, 1, 1 p.m. And I got a strict instruction, you know, that we have to, as you know, usually the seminar has to close at 1. And I think, again, thanks very much, uh, 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 Phil, for this really exciting presentation. And I think a new insight in, in really also if you can use high level analytical tools, not only for, you know, sometimes this is a bit this uh, uh, perception, very boring routine stuff, and you can really use it for really discovery and complete new areas. And I think there's definitely a big, big future for the things, for this, this, uh, uh, for this area. And if you have really some, specific questions, please send, I think it was at the beginning, uh, email to Phil. If you don't uh, have the contact, you can send it to myself or Yasmina, and we are more than happy to forward the email or the question to Phil. And I think you're flying back tomorrow night. Yeah, so please, if you have anything, don't hesitate, we can we can forward the email. So at the end, as usual, so the next um, seminar is on Tuesday, August 1st. And please visit the Kwaki Science Seminars website for more information and title and presenter. And yeah, if you are really, uh, hopefully you enjoyed the seminar today, maybe you are for the first time a participant, you can all, always uh, sign up for the seminar invitation and the updates via kwabi.uq.edu.au uh, slash science uh, hyphen seminars. And or you you can also ask Greg Hartner if you have specific questions. Otherwise, again, thank you very much for tuning in. I know it's a really busy time and, and for your time, the last hour. And yeah, see you next time. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.